Welcome to the website video. If you guys do not have a website, you probably need to pause, go get one, because I am a huge proponent that websites can make or break businesses these days. I feel like you need to have a little corner of the web that is yours that you can manipulate. Do not rely upon social media to be your website. Do not rely upon word of mouth only. We need to have somewhere that everyone can go to that you can control. If you're putting all your eggs in the Facebook or social media baskets, that can be gone in an instant. Mark Zuckerberg could take his toys and go home and we don't want that. We want to make sure that you're able to control as much as possible. You want to make sure that you're able to control the website and all the content on it. And the only way we can do that is by having our own. So we want to be on our own host. We want to have our own structure. And I, this is not a tech video to go and how to set up a website. I want to talk about the legal legalities of maintaining your website and making sure that all of that is legally proper. This is also going to cross over a bit into newsletter legalities because a lot of it that roots right at your website. You're probably going to have an opt-in form on there and so privacy policies are going to be part of what we're going to talk about here shortly. If you do not have a website and I'm staring you down right now, please pause and go do it then come back. If you do have a website, I want you to pause and go scroll and see if you have website terms, if you have a privacy policy, if you're e-commerce or anything like that, if you need to have proper SSL, and also figuring out if you have proper contact information so if a customer has a problem, can they reach out to you. If you don't have any of those, you need this video. If you do have all of those, you still need this video as an audit. Let's first start with website terms. If you guys look at any website, any large major website, they're going to have terms of service, terms of use, whatever they want to call it, depending on what kind of platform they're offering. These are the terms that are going to govern between yourself, the business, and the visitors that come to your website. You may be a website that simply is visitors, that they're just getting information, contacting you, and that's it. Maybe you are selling stuff through your website and so there, or you're providing other services through the website, then you're going to have terms of use because they're using or service of the website. So you're going to have terms of use, terms of service, relatively interchangeably as far as um, the headings. Please don't get tripped up on headings or titles of legal documents and stuff throughout these courses because what is inside of it is what's going to matter the most. So when I say website terms, I'm encapsulating either terms of use, terms of service, depending on which is proper for your business. But like I said, these terms are going to create the legal relationship between you and the visitor or the user, and it's going to regulate that and govern that relationship. You're also utilizing it as an expectation setting tool, get informing the visitors and users of the website who you are, what you do, um, if you're taking any sort of data, especially if you're advertising into EU countries, the GDPR, uh, General Data Protection Regulation Act, is going to regulate what type of data that you can collect from people. And when I say data, I'm talking about tracking scripts, Facebook pixels, beacons, um, cookies, all of that, um, as well as when people submit their information to you. But your website terms are going to be the legal document that's going to hold all of this legal information for you so that you're able to uh, be in a legal relationship, set the confines of the relationship with the user and or visitor, and hopefully protect you in the end. The website terms will vary depending upon what's on your website and all of that. But perhaps the most important part of that is going to be a privacy policy. I've seen them where people stick them together. Uh, I'm a big proponent of having website terms separate from privacy policy because from a tech perspective, when I have an opt-in form on my website and I want to let people be able to, you know, link their URL or hyperlink the privacy policy from there, I want them to be taken directly to the privacy policy. So whether you do that through another page as a privacy policy or you simply do a link that anchors, which means it automatically takes them to the privacy policy portion of the website terms, I want to make it easy for the user, the person who's getting ready to give me their information as much as possible. 
So yes, you can have website terms and you can have your privacy policy together or separate. Administratively, I just break mine out and I mention in my website terms the privacy policy and I link over to it. And both of these are hyperlinked in my footer. My privacy policy is also linked at the opt-in. If you have an e-commerce shop or any sort of checkout like that, I also have any governing terms that go there. You can oftentimes put those in a website terms, but you may have separate terms such as shop terms or maybe you're selling a specific service and so you may have a services agreement you're going to have them sign or identify uh, separately. So you've got all these different documents playing on, so don't get confused beyond them. Just look at what they're specifically going to be working to do. Site terms. We've already kind of jumped into the deep end a little bit. I just wanted to clarify that we are going to have multiple different documents. So the first document that we want to talk through, though, is the website terms. And again, this is governing and creating a legal relationship with you and the user. And here's a good checklist of items that you want to have included. Obviously, the visitor is accepting the terms by use of the website. It's also going to be acceptance of privacy policy, which we're going to talk about here a little bit, how that also uh, weighs in if you are under a GDPR regulation. It, your terms are going to outline what your business and your website is doing, any obligation that you have on the visitors, um, ownership of the site and the content. This is also really important to put people on notice when we start looking at intellectual property stuff, uh, trademarks, word marks, logos, photographs, and all that. Other videos, we talk about that a bit more, but we're going to make sure that it's integrated into our website terms so that we put people on notice of who owns the site and the content that's on it. We've already talked about this, but incorporation of the privacy policy, and we will go into those details in a second. If you are having referral links or any other third party type agreements, we want to identify that here. Maybe you have advertisers on your site or you're linking Amazon products that you recommend to your customers or visitors. You're going to want to make sure you do all the proper disclosures on those links. Again, we talk about the marketing legality stuff, but for here in our website terms, we want to address if there's any referral links or any sort of advertising type agreements, especially if you're using advertisers, you want to have some disclaimer in there that the advertisers opinions are theirs and not yours, yada, yada. Um, you guys have seen those typical disclaimers before. If not, obviously Rachel Brinke has all of that. You guys can take a look at and getting the template there or having your local attorney draft it for you. But just recognize in the website terms, we want to make sure that we are going to address um, any referral links and or uh, agreements. This does not alleviate any disclosure requirements elsewhere, which you guys will know from watching in the marketing legalities. But this is just another thing that we can add to help bolster our argument and strength if there's ever a problem. If you ever get pinged for non-disclosure or there's a question, um, it's also been in your website terms and your visitors were on notice about it there as well. Any intellectual property licenses? Are you being licensed the use of the business name? Maybe someone else already had the name registered and you wanted to use it and they've extended a license. This is where we put an identification of that. Or maybe you're the trademark owner. Again, we talk about this in the other video, but this is where you're going to boil it down into. You're going to identify the intellectual property ownership and licenses that are in existence. This can also go for photographs that are on your website, audio or text that you're using. It does not alleviate any other um, obligations you may have to credit to elsewhere on the site. But again, we're all boiling it down into the terms to put our visitors and users on notice. Any other disclaimers that you need to have in relation to the specific business policies and procedures you have. And here's some legal miscellany. We talk about this in contracts, but I definitely want you guys to understand that website terms are a contract. It is between you and the visitor of your site. You're going to have things like, this is going to be the entire agreement, a disclaimer that terms may change, any warranties that you have, all the way down to governing law and jurisdiction. If you have a dispute in relation to your website terms and or privacy policy, what law is going to govern that? This is especially important if you have international visitors. It's even important if you just have visitors in other states. You don't necessarily want California law being applied and being held into court in California if you're a Florida business. Put it in here. This is part of, this is an agreement on the website, and you want to make sure that that language is in there as well to ensure that at least you have a fighting chance if there's any dispute. But on under the website terms, you're going to have some governing governance in there as well. 
So now let's get over to the privacy policy. Again, this can be part of the website terms, but I typically break it out. Privacy policy is really going to be the biggest bulk of your website terms, I believe. Oh, one other note that I wanted to say that I failed to mention with website terms. Under the intellectual property license stuff, maybe you're using stock photography and all of that, make sure that you're also including that in there. Um, you can also identify in your website terms and privacy policy, maybe you do uh, joint venture, joint partnership type stuff with people. If you're gonna be sharing any of the information, you're gonna want that prominent website terms and we're also gonna reiterate that over here in the privacy policy uh, because we want to ensure that users understand that their information can be shared with people outside of your site. However, for me, what I when I draft the privacy policies, I typically do it for only the entity, so only your business. That's how our template is drafted. It's only for you um, to utilize. If you want to expand that, you can. The reason I don't really want it to be this unfettered expansion um, is because I, as a user, don't necessarily want to submit my information and know that you're going to go and share it with 500 other sites or sell it. I want to know that if I'm entrusting in you to give you my personal information, whether it's my phone number, if it's my email, my name, I want you to be using that information for the purposes of why I'm on your site, which is for you and not anybody else. So when you're going through the privacy policy, just look at it from a lens of, am I planning on sharing this with people? Then it needs to be drafted as such. If I'm only going to utilize it for myself, that's great too. Make sure it's drafted as such. And within that, we're going to identify some of these key things. What information is being collected? Well, it's pretty straightforward when we have our email address or phone number because the user is submitting all that in there. It's not as straightforward when it's internet traffic data, cookies, Facebook pixels, beacons, and things like that because the visitor, user, may not realize that that stuff is being tracked, um, especially if they're an older generation or they're just not tech savvy. Uh, so we, are, we should be sharing this information. I want to do a side note here. If you are advertising in the EU countries, you are subjected to GDPR regulations. It's the General Data Protection Regula Regulation Act. Essentially, everything I'm addressing for what should be included in a privacy policy and how we draft it here at, um, on Rachel Branke is we do it in accordance with GDPR. A, it's easier because then everyone's covered, but also because actually GDPR requirements, and I'm not going to go into a whole crash course on what the requirements are because you're about to see it because it's included in our privacy policy, uh, but they're good business practices. And second, I'm also finding that a lot of states, so there is state regulation when it comes to privacy law, stuff like this. This is another reason to have your privacy policy is states are becoming very, very, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're cracking down. They're cracking down and trying to help protect consumers. That's kind of the whole point. And so they're putting this burden on you to be transparent and tell um, consumers, visitors to your website, what you're doing, how you're getting their information, what information, and what you're going to be doing with that. So first, we're going to go with what information is collected, internet traffic data, cookies, beacons, Facebook pixels, which is a big one, Google Analytics, um, Google ad pixels or anything else that you guys may have there as well. You also want to outline what um, customer or visitor personal information. So not just what information is collected, but also what you're going to do with that information. How, what's collected, how you're using it. Um, let me back up for a second. What information is collected, how you're collecting it, how you're going to use it, and if you're going to share it. And I've already given you guys the 411 on my opinion for that. You also want to let them know that they, as the user, the customer, um, the submitter <laughs> to your website or to your opt-in form, um, let them know that they have access to find out what information you have on them. This is a very key thing of GDPR, but I have nothing to hide. If my, if you guys want to know what information I have on you uh, from being a purchaser to my website through this, I'm more than happy to show you. It's literally not much more than your name, your mailing address, your um, email address, and maybe some demographics, like the Google Analytics site demographics that you get, because um, we don't carry any of our own uh, money processing stuff. We don't really have any more sensitive data than that, but 
we do have secured SSLs, you know, the little lock you see at the top of the URL, we have all of that to make sure that even that information is secured as possible, which is the next point. What security do you have in place? And a lot of small business owners don't actually have security measures or thoughts. Um, not that you don't have thoughts, but I mean, like, as far as implementation of workflows in the business place, what, how are you going to keep from being breached? What are you, what's your process if you are breached? And also something to think about here and make note on, does my business insurance cover cyber breaches and, or is that da just damages to my customers or visitors? Is that going to help pay for the cleanup? Is that going to help pay the attorney's fees if there's an issue? These are questions you need to ask your insurance agent for your business insurance. We talked about in the business entity video. Business entity is just one portion. Insurance is another. So here's a key part of that. You don't just want the standard liability, especially if you're doing online business where you're accepting payments, which kind of is all right when you have Stripe and PayPal being intermediary processors for you. But if you are in that heightened level of need of security and you're accepting a lot of personal information, you need to have this security plan in place, which is going to be outlined in your private for the most part in your privacy policy, you're not gonna put every piece of your workflow out there, but you're gonna let your um, users know what happens, with, what, what is your security plan and what happens in the event of a breach. And also make sure that your insurance is gonna help um, cover you or to assist if you ever have a problem like that. Um, depending also what type of activities you do on your website within the privacy policy and terms, you want to look at identifying surveys and contests. Your specific states may have certain disclaimers that you want to have based on um, if you're doing giveaways, etc. Like no purchase necessary, those type of disclaimers. You guys have seen them before. So make sure you note that down to identify and search for your state and make sure that it's in your website terms and or privacy policy. Another one is testimonials on site. I am a big fan of utilizing testimonials. However, as we talked about in marketing legalities, you're going to have to have certain disclosures if you are uh, getting testimonials in exchange for a compensation, money, gift card, um, services, product, etc. You guys will hear more about that in that video. But if you're here's another place that you can put your testimonials disclosure um, just so that people are on notice of any testimonials, affiliate links we talked about, free products and so forth. Again, marketing legalities, but just understand that uh, your privacy policy also needs to uh, make sure you're in your website terms are contemplating all of these together. So just a quick rundown again, we want to make sure that we visitors accept our terms. Terms may vary. They're an accepted privacy policy. You're outlining what your business does, ownership of site and content, any visitor obligations, addressing referral links, agreements, disclosures, disclaimers when it comes to products, any intellectual property licenses, use of stock photography licenses, um, your entire agreement, any warranties, governing law, governing venue, contact information, which is another point with the privacy policy, my bullet points here, what information is collected, um, what you're doing with that information, how you're collecting it, are you sharing it, your, uh, the user's access to know what info you have, if you're under GDPR, they also can request to have it deleted, um, and so then you can delete um, any of the extra information. You can retain some information that you need for by law or business record. Just make sure you're in line with that. Surveys and contests and security and any other miscellany that you guys may have for your specific business policies or procedures. Maybe you don't have to do refunds, etc. That would be in your website terms or your shop terms as well. Another thing to note on the website terms and privacy policy here um, is you can put disclaimers all day long on your website. I'm going to talk about it here in a second, or you can put notices. And what I mean by that is I can stick a legal disclaimer in the footer of my website since I have to, and that's great. It's going to go website terms, privacy policy, legal disclaimer. Maybe you have a specific disclaimer you need to put, make it prominent but also put it in your terms. Like put as many places as you can to make sure that it is seen. That's why the next thing I'm gonna recommend is that we put proper notices for the different intellectual property things that we have going on. 
For example, I would recommend that you put a copyright notice at the bottom of your website because it's then going to be putting actual notice to all visitors of the website that all the information, text, video, audio, whatever intellectual property you're posting there is owned by you and protected by copyright laws. Not having it does not remove your ownership, but it makes it a stronger argument as, as I, of your intellectual property attorney, has to help you if something's ever stolen or taken off of there. I also recommend right-click disabling and watermarking photographs as much as you can, but that's still not going to stop people from stealing. So trying to put a, um, by putting a copyright notice at the bottom of the website, really important. If you have a registered trademark, make sure that's also included, footer of the website, and also have the registered R on the trademark when it's used, putting actual notices, and it can have direct impact on damages also. So just make sure you guys are doing those sorts of things when you're looking at your website. Don't just get your terms and privacy policies slapped on there and move, go on your merry way. Make sure you're also looking through the lens of, okay, when I go through my website terms and we're talking about the intellectual property ownership and licenses, let me go ahead and run through all the intellectual property that I own. Let me make sure that it has proper notices on here so I can try to deter people from stealing. So I can also have preserve my argument for damages. And it's just, that's just routine things that you guys can do when you're auditing through your website and making sure that you are securing as much of the legal protections as you can. So again, website terms, privacy policy, any other shop or contract terms, which we can talk about in the contract section, copyright notices, trademark notices, and any other specific disclaimers or disclosures that you need to make. Separate them out, put them in the footer menu, put them at the bottom, make them prominent, whatever it is that you need to do, just ensure that all of that's on there so your website can be legally protected.